Okay, good evening. Tonight's question is about pride. More generally, it's about dealing with special conditions, special problems. Because the question remarks that anger is easy, easier to note, to deal with, but pride is difficult. So how can you how can you recognize this is an interesting part of the question is how can you recognize the early signs of pride so you can get it before it escalates that's insightful i think uh, but then how can you work to uproot pride in the long run that's the question one of the practices i think it says And so, in, in one sense, this isn't a very good question, because it, but but it's it's not uncommon, not an uncommon sort of question because it's recognizing something as a problem, right? Even in even in the practice of meditation, insight meditation, which is meant to be problem solving in, in a sense. It's meant to be a, an answer to this question, how do you deal with suffering, how do you deal with defilement? But even in that practice you've got problems. Right? Anger is not a problem, it's a problem but you, within the framework you can deal with it. Um, but we got a problem for the problem solving, is that how do you deal with these special problems? Pride. So it's not a very good question because it it suggests a lack of understanding in regards to mindfulness, in regards to seeing clearly vipassana. There are no categorically different problems like pride. Uh, mindful. The, the way to deal with all of our problems is, in the end, not about fixing them, and asking asking for a practice to rid yourself of them is is not the right way. It's not about ridding yourself of problems. It's about understanding experiences. The problem is in our perspective, and pride is a part of wrong perspective. The observation is, is astute because there is a difference between pride and anger. <coughs> the, a, a good distinction to understand is that uh, anger, anger based emotions like fear, boredom, depression, frustration, hatred, sadness, all of these ones, they are highly blamed by oneself and by others, but they are quick to change, and so they're acute, they're the kind of problem that you are quickly able to recognize, uh, but they are also quite easy to, to deal with, you think, because they go away. I mean, it appears that they're easy to deal with. You, you, you fix them in a sense quite easily because they're quick to change. It's not actually that we fix them; it's that they're quick to change. They don't; they're not lasting in that sense because they're uncomfortable. You know, people with dip chronic depression or uh, anger issues might might disagree, but relatively speaking. When you're when you're actually being mindful of them, they're much easier to deal with. But they keep coming back, and they're acute, in the sense that you yourself are 
displeased by them and other people are displeased when they see them in you. Greed, on the other hand, is uh, slow to change, but it's little blamed. It's, it's lightly blamed by oneself and by others. So greed is, well, the, these two qualities go together because the fact that we don't see it as such a problem generally means that, of course, it lasts. It's not acute the stress that comes from wanting, from craving, is a little bit subdued. It's not acute. It's like blunt. We don't even realize that we're suffering because there's so much pleasure often involved with craving when you get what you want. You fixate on that because of the craving. So your mind, in your mind, craving is a good thing because your, your mind is fixed on, on the getting. And until you can change your perspective, it's hard to find blame in it. Once you start to observe it, you start to see how much stress and suffering is involved with craving. And, but for the most part, it's not, not very blameworthy. Other people as well. It's, of course, uh, extreme greed is, is criticized. But generally speaking, we, we celebrate it often in each other, in ourselves and in each other, describing our likes, our partialities, romance and even uh, carnal pleasures, food, sex, music, celebrating all of these. Wow, I liked that, I love that, I love this. We say it as though it's something to be proud of. But um, yes, greed is therefore different from anger. And delusion, the bad news is that delusion, those those states that are like pride, or delusion, unlike greed and anger, relates to distortion. It's not a liking or a disliking. It's some sort of distortion of of reality many kinds. Pride is one common example. Pride is a distorted perception of worth of, of, that's related to uh, possession and ownership, uh, identification. You, know, you identify with something, this is me, and you're proud of it. You, know, you, you esteem it. It's often caught up in things like low self-esteem and worry and fear of failure and so on. Fear of being uh, inferior or being lacking. But there are many other kinds. Um, ignorance is, of course, the overarching one. Wrong view. Uh, even worry and doubt, these are in the ignorance category. Or in the delusion category. Now, delusion... Delusion is, the, the bad news is that it's the worst, it's both slow to change and very much blamed. People who are conceited, arrogant, with wrong views and obstinate, it's very unpleasant for oneself and for others. People who get caught up in, in it live very uncomfortable lives both internally and in, and in relation to the people around them. But this is all descriptive. None of it is prescriptive in the sense that it doesn't define how we practice. It doesn't define how we practice in any way. It's just a way of helping to understand and in fact tell you the opposite, that um, this, this is just descriptive. The differences that you're experiencing and that you're uh, recognizing in anger and, and delusion are are just that, are just um, difference, just the, the differences that they they belong within a framework of reality that is caught up in misunderstanding. 
the way they're related to each other is that delusion gives rise to greed and anger. Without the basis of distortion, you can't get greedy and angry. And once you've gotten rid of the delusion, you'll see that greed and anger still come up. It, there's still some delusion there, but even when you're parting the veil and, and you're mindful, you're going to still see it push through. There's delusion there as well, but meaning that the, you're, you're wor even when you're working against it, you're going to be fighting with greed and anger. This is why in the Satipatthana Sutta, the Buddha says, Vineya loke abhijja domanasam. He says, one now is working to get rid of greed and anger, craving and, and aversion. But he doesn't mention delusion, because delusion is the opposite of mindfulness. When you're mindful, all of the things like pride and arrogance and wrong view and so on, they, they have no room to arise. You'll see them arise when you're not mindful, but your mindfulness will stop them from from proliferating and you'll very much see the greed and the anger and seeing the greed and the anger is uh, is lack of delusion is the freedom from delusion so they are related and there is a difference in terms of how the practice uh, deals with them delusion in one sense things like pride and so on are not something you can ever uh, really be mindful of because they're the opposite of being mindful. They're not they're not easy to catch because any time you're in a state of being able to catch them, they're, they're not going to be there. But ang and anger and greed as well will not technically be there. But mindfulness is not really about being mindful of what's in the actual present moment. It feels like that, but it's actually a response. And that's what it's meant to be. It's meant to be a replacement for our ordinary ways of responding to things. Ordinarily something comes up, we respond with greed, we respond with anger, we respond with delusion. Even greed, anger and delusion come up, we respond further with more of the same or something in reaction to it or so on. And we feel guilty about them and so on. Mindfulness is a replacement for all that. So rather than feeling guilty about your anger, you're mindful of it. Rather than being... Um, uh, identifying with the craving or, or self-righteous about your desire Acknowledging it Rather than perpetuating the delusion Cutting it off with, with mindfulness Yani sotani lokas ming sati desan niwaryam Whatever streams there are in the world Mindfulness is their stop Is what stops them So in, what, in brief, I guess, the answer to the question is that there is no difference. And the fact that you're trying to find a difference is a part of the problem. And the best you know, solution is to become more uh, un accomplished and, and more, com more familiar with mindfulness, with the power and the, the efficacy of mindfulness. Once you understand and appreciate and experience how how powerful it is to be present, you will see that they, there, there's nothing else you need because at that moment there is no room for pride. There's no room for any of these things. But if you want a, um, a more perhaps satisfying answer, then we, we have to answer a more direct answer, I suppose, we have to answer more generally in terms of how do you get rid of any defilement because the same will apply to anger, the same will apply to pride and the answer is wisdom when you see clearly you come to understand and when you understand understanding is the opposite of pride it's the opposite of delusion and so with no pride, with no delusion, with no distortion, there is then no room for greed or anger to rise as well, to arise as well. Wisdom is of three types, of course. So you can 
if you want a, a comprehensive sort of regimen of practice, you need three kinds of, of wisdoms. The first is sutta maya panya, you have to gain knowledge. So listening to a talk like this might give you some knowledge you didn't know, might give you some perspective that you didn't have, intellectual perspective. You have to hear, you have to listen or read or, or gain some contact with an answer to your question, for example. Uh, jinta, maya panya, jinta maya panya, which means from thinking. So you have to reflect and understand the teachings. You have to learn, once you hear how to practice, you have to get an understanding of how to practice, an appreciation of the practice. You have to understand the, the, the need for a change of perspective rather than trying to fix your problems. Stop looking at them as problems to start seeing reality as experiences and try to understand your experiences. Try to see them clearly so that you can understand them, not in an intellectual sense, but uh, understand them as being just what they are. Understand them as an experience as being an experience rather than being a problem. So the intellectual understanding of all that is jinta maya panya. And then finally, of course, bhavana maya panya. You have to gain the actual clarity. There's no multiplicity of paths. The only path is this kind of wisdom. When you actually do uh, set, your, set yourself to the practice of mindfulness, Mindfulness being the confronting and the facing of your experiences, seeing them just as they are, seeing is just seeing, hearing is just hearing. Once you gain that perspective, when you are present, when your experiences are your reality, there will arise wisdom. And it's not intellectual wisdom, it's not a thought, it's not an insight, a flash of insight, it's a perspective, it's a clarity of understanding. Because the opposite of all of these bad things, greed, anger, and delusion, is clarity, is a perfect, perfect attunement to reality. It is what it is, and I see it as that, not as me, as mine, as this, as that, as good, as bad, as anything that it's not. There's nothing extrenu extrenuous, there's just what there is. And when you're when you're there, when you are experiencing seeing as seeing and hearing as hearing, then there's no there's no further um, proliferation of all these bad things. They become weaker. They don't gain traction. They're, they they fade away because they're as habits. They have to be reinforced in order to be maintained. Because you're not maintaining them, they fade away, and eventually the Perfect clarity changes your your uh, well your perspective, but it's deeper than that. It changes your fundamental outlook on reality. You know, it's it's the change of perspective that's so fundamental, so profound that you your your craving for things is shattered, your aversion to things is shattered. And your identification with things, your delusion about them is just shattered because you have had this experience of complete freedom from suffering that is pure, that is perfect, that is absolute. So there's an answer to that question. Thank you for listening. <laughs>